This video was written by What If Football. We have got a whole series with another five episodes after this video, covering in detail the 1999 treble winning side. But in this first episode of the series, I'll be going through United's whole history in the lead up to the treble, adding some much needed context before we get into the actual treble winning season in the later episodes of this series. So to get notified when the other episodes come out or to be able to watch the ones that already are, subscribe to the channel and click the bell for notifications and you can check out the description for any of my previous videos as well. So in order to understand the treble of 1999, the greatest achievement by an English football club, we first must understand Manchester United. But before Manchester United, before Old Trafford, and even before the red shirts or the green and gold halves of Newton Heath, there stood Free Trade Hall and the Corn Exchange, as well as the Irwell snaked through the city nicknamed Cottonopolis. Manchester, the first of Britain's industrial cities that burgeoned in the 19th century, had one more trick up its sleeve. So it's 1878 and the dining room committee of the Carriage and Wagon Works, a railway department in northwest England, set up a football team. They were too good for the interdepartmental competition, so they were shifted into the Lancashire Leagues, and they were named after the suburb of North Manchester where they were formed, Newton Heath. John Henry Davies would save the club and this prompted a colour change to red and a name switch. Manchester Central and Manchester Celtic were both rejected as ideas, with the first rejected so that they wouldn't be confused with the then main railway station in Manchester, and the second because it would be named after the more successful team up north. And so Manchester United were born, at the time in the shadow of the city's bigger club Manchester City, who were present at attempts to revive Newton Heath financially. Ernest Magnell was a man tasked with bringing Manchester United into the 20th century. Promotion in 1906 was followed by two league titles, both from Aston Villa, with the club's first FA Cup trophy sandwiched in between in 1909 over Bristol City. Also sandwiched in between was breaking ground, Old Trafford to be precise, in a 4-3 loss in United's new home to Liverpool on February the 19th in 1910. It was a home that was supposed to be fit for the next big team in English football, with promises of over 100,000 people in attendance. That didn't come to pass, largely because of the upcoming troubling times financially. On the other side of the First World War, both Jack Robson and John Chapman were both hired as managers, mainly for their frugal approach to spending, as United stagnated throughout the 1920s. However, a shining beacon of hope would arrive at the club in 1931, in the form of textiles magnate James Gibson. At the time of his arrival as chairman, Manchester United seemed destined for the third division. But his very first board meeting would shape the rest of the club's history. He desired an academy team to feed the senior and reserve teams. The youth policy was established, and in 1937 the Manchester United Junior Athletic Club was inaugurated to aid the youth development. United's yo-yoing between the first and second divisions would cease with the onset of another global war. In December 1944, club official Louis Rocker wrote to Matt Busby imploring the former Liverpool and Manchester City player to consider his first job in football management to be at Old Trafford. Despite a verbal agreement with Liverpool, Busby accepted on the conditions that he was given five years and full autonomy. He surrounded himself with like-minded individuals to form the strong bond of family. Jimmy Murphy was Busby's right-hand man who he had met in Bari during the war. Burt Whaley assisted Murphy in shaping the players of tomorrow, while scout Joe Armstrong would be the man to acquire those players. And this quartet by 1948 would build the first great Manchester United team. Four silver medals in the first five seasons in the league were supplemented with another FA Cup, was won against the Blackpool team in 1948 that contained greats like Stan Mortison and Stanley Matthews. Manchester United had spread their net as far and as wide as the times would allow, in order to create the Busby Babes, the second great Manchester United team. With the inauguration of the FA Youth Cup, the United stranglehold on the competition accentuated Busby's desire for youth. What was once just a successful team had now added beautiful football to its arsenal. Matt Busby, a man who became known as the first tracksuit manager, was wedded, as many were at the time, to the WM system. However, Don Revy remarked upon watching a United reserve team that they were more fluid and reminded him of the superb Hungarian team that dismantled England in 1953. But Busby could evolve tactically with the times as well, following the back four trend which was popularised by World Cup winners Brazil. Ray Wood was United goalkeeper, although he would be replaced by Harry Gregg in late 1957. Roger Byrne and Bill Fawkes were the pillars of the defence. And the players that would now be referred to as midfielders were Jackie Blanchflower, Mark Jones, Eddie Coleman and Duncan Edwards. 
Labelling the latter of Coleman and Edwards as merely midfielders, or as they would have been known in the 50s as wingbacks or halfbacks, would be a disservice to their incredible abilities. Up front, United had a plethora of talent, which included David Pegg, Dennis Violet, Billy Whelan and Bobby Charlton from the youth system, whilst Tommy Taylor was signed from Barnsley for £30,000. And together United's attack was insatiable. They were on calls for three league titles in a row and it teamed with superlative football both domestically and abroad. And they would be the first English club to play in the European Cup, going against the Football League's wishes but a route that was aided by FA Chief Stanley Rouse that Matt Busby would take. After a late dash back from a 1958 last 16 tie in Prague, United only narrowly arrived back at Old Trafford in time to draw 3-3 with Birmingham City in the league. This prompted the head of the Football League, Alan Hardacar, to impose a strict rule that demanded any team travelling back from Europe must be back in the country 24 hours prior to a domestic arrangement. United only faced elimination from the European Cup the previous year when paired with the experience of a domineering Real Madrid in the semi-finals. A 3-3 draw in Belgrade over Red Star confirmed a potential final with Los Blancos should United overcome Milan. Chartering a flight from Belgrade, Matt Busby, his players, staff and several journalists land in Munich for refueling. Just past 3pm local time at the third attempt to take off from Munich Ream Airport, BEA Flight 609 was unable to gain enough speed on a slush-soaked runway and subsequently crashed. Busby would lose coaches like Tom Curry and Burt Whaley, as well as players like Roger Byrne, Jeff Bent, David Pegg, Eddie Coleman, Billy Whelan, Tommy Taylor and Duncan Edwards. Johnny Berry and Jack Blanche Flowers' respected careers were over, and 23 people in total lost their lives. Matt Busby only narrowly escaped the same fate, with his last rights being read on two different occasions. As the remaining stars of the brightest football team in England recovered, the snow in Munich thawed, meaning that had they stayed in Munich overnight, the disaster could have been averted. Manchester United as ever were emboldened by Busby's spirit. The city imbued a football sense like never before. The manager would make a public appearance in losing a cup final effort to Bolton before returning to reignite the Phoenix from its ashes. Busby would suffer with enormous bouts of guilt, only spurred on to continue the job at times by his wife Jean, and only five years later with a new team were United successful again. Through the struggles in the league, it didn't suggest so. Busby created Manchester United's third great football team. Narrowly avoiding relegation, United won their first piece of silverware since Munich with an FA Cup final win over Leicester in 1963, a trophy which Bill Falks declared as the single most important trophy in the history of the club. In the team that day, as well as survivors Falks and Bobby Charlton, were Tony Dunn, Shea Brennan and Paddy Crerund, and all five would be on the same turf years later at the European Cup final. Dennis Law, a major proponent of both teams, would sadly miss the 1968 final through injury, and it was he, alongside Charlton and youth recruit George Best, that completed the trinity. Never had a collection of players shone so brightly together at the club before. All three would win the Ballon d'Or between 1964 and 1968, and they would all be immortalised opposite the great man who they served, Sir Matt Busby, outside of Old Trafford till this day. George Best, a man perhaps befitting that surname, alongside Nobby Styles, John Aston Jr. and David Sadler, helped return United to Youth Cup glory in 1964. Alongside goalkeeper Alex Stepney, the latest name of the academy wagon was Brian Kidd, and they would both make the 11 that defeated Benfica for the club's first European Cup. It was a relief for many, the realisation of a dream for Sir Matt Busby after so many brutal knockdowns, the latest of which saw United pick themselves up off the canvas in the latest semi-final defeat in 1966, a harrowing return to Belgrade against Partizan. When talking about the 1968 triumph, Bobby Charlton stated, There was an understanding that something was over, something that had dominated our lives for so long. Eight players from the final team were academy products, and half of those were from Manchester. The dream, not only of Matt Busby, but of former chairman Gibson, had truly been realised. There was a feeling of job done, that's what it felt like to George Best, barely 22 when Europe was conquered. Matt Busby left his post the following year, promoting 31-year-old Wilf McGuinness from within, whilst remaining as general manager. The club would oscillate from the introverted Franco Farrell to the extroverted Tommy Doherty, and back again from Dave Sexton to Ron Atkinson. Trophies were won over this period, but United never really threatened to return to the heights of Busby. 
Enter Alex Ferguson, the former striker from Govan, helped displace the old firm up north and gifted Aberdeen their only European glory with the Cup Winners' Cup against Real Madrid in 1983. This success alongside his determination and standards made him an ideal candidate for Old Trafford. Within weeks in Manchester, he had trebled the scouting system with more than an eye on the youth policy enacted by Gibson and Busby of yesteryear. With the project needing time and bearing no fruit, a 2 1 defeat at home to Crystal Palace in December 1989 became immortalised with a banner that was headed Tara Fergie. But it was Mark Robbins' FA Cup third round match winner at the city ground against Nottingham Forest which helped propel the bottom half of United to the FA Cup final. Its importance in terms of Fergie's long term job prospects in Manchester are thought to be an urban myth. However, the news certainly loosened somewhat around the Scots neck after Crystal Palace were dispatched at Wembley. Glory in the Cup Winners Cup over Barcelona in Rotterdam came and the League Cup followed a year later, and so the cornerstones of United's fourth great football team were being built. Peter Schmeichel kept goal behind Paul Parker, Gary Pallister, Steve Bruce and Dennis Irwin. A mixture of Ryan Giggs, Lee Sharp and Andre Konchelskis ran the wings, whilst Brian Robson and Paul Ince were dynamic forces certainly behind Mark Hughes and of course the final piece of the puzzle which was Eric Cantona. Guided by Sir Matt Busby's pipe smoke in the Manchester United offices and his long chats with the pillar of the institution he now managed, Sir Alex Ferguson was able to give Matt Busby his final wish. Ferguson's first three pieces of silverware did earn him respite, but it was his first league title at United in 1993 which earned him the belief of the supporters, but unfortunately this would be followed by Sir Matt Busby passing just seven months later. Springboarded by a first league title in 26 years, Cantona and co would go one better and pick up a double in 1994, with the Frenchman being deployed in the number 10 position behind the main striker, being a maverick and a clutch player in the rigid days of the English 4-4-2. However, there still lay the bumps in the road. The continual failings in Istanbul, Helsinki and Barcelona, in the revamped Champions League and the concession of the Premier League to Blackburn Rovers after Eric Cantona had Kung Fu kicked his way into a nine-month ban. Compounding that sour mood was Ferguson's fire sow of 1995. Gone were the stalwarts of Mark Hughes, Paul Ince and Andre Kinchelskis with Paul Parker, Steve Bruce and Lee Sharp departing 12 months later. And so Ferguson was in the process of creating Manchester United's fifth great team. His fledglings included the 1992 Youth Cup winners David Beckham, Ryan Giggs, Nicky Bart, Paul Scholes and the Neville brothers. Alongside Andy Cole, Roy Keane, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Teddy Sheringham, that team would inch nearer and nearer to the holy